Hi, welcome to our tutorial on the STLCG Toolbox, a toolbox that leverages modern automatic differentiation tools to compute signal temporal logic robustness formulas and its gradients. This toolbox makes it easy to incorporate logic specifications into problems that entail gradient-based solutions, such as optimization-based control and neural network training. First off, why are we interested in logics for robotics applications? Well, in many settings, there are rules that govern how systems should behave. For instance, in an urban air mobility setting, there could be rules such as a drone must hover until the drone ahead has landed, or if there is a drone above, then do not increase altitude in the next 30 seconds, or if the oncoming drone does not slow down within the next 10 seconds, then increase altitude. The presence of rules is ubiquitous in other applications as well, including autonomous driving, surveillance, and social navigation. The rules could be prescribed by regulators derived from domain expertise or even learned from experience. Regardless of where such rules come from, it is often desirable to use them as an inductive bias in data-driven models, or it might be necessary to synthesize them into robot decision-making algorithms, for example, in the context of safety-critical applications. Then the question is, how do we leverage rules stemming, for example, from domain expertise and synthesize them into decision-making and model learning algorithms? Specifically, there are two questions one needs to address. First, how do we express rules? And second, how do we embed this knowledge into the algorithms? In this talk, we focus on using a signal temporal logic to express rules. STL is an expressive formal language that can be used to translate a natural language into a mathematical representation. Special to STL is a notion of robustness, which measures how much an STL formula is satisfied or violated. With the notion of robustness, we can obtain a gradient and therefore use STL within a gradient-based solution techniques. In this context, the STLCG toolbox leverages modern automatic differentiation tools by expressing STL robustness formulas as computation graphs. This provides an easy and efficient way to incorporate STL into many types of robot algorithms, from model predictive control to deep learning. For the rest of this tutorial talk, my collaborator, Karen Leung, will give a short overview of signal temporal logic and will introduce STLCG, applications of STLCG, and some code demo on how to use it. Thank you, Marco. First up, I will give an overview of signal temporal logic, or STL, and I will cover what it is, and what is special about it that makes it attractive for many robotics applications. As Marco mentioned before, there is the question of how to express domain expertise into a form where we can synthesize that information into our robot algorithms. If we take a closer look here, we need to be able to translate domain expertise, which is often represented in natural language, into some mathematical representation that can then be used for synthesis. And this is precisely what makes STL attractive. It is a formal language that is capable of translating specifications made in natural language into a mathematical representation that can then be used directly for synthesis. In the next couple of slides, I will describe the building blocks, grammar, and semantics of the STL language. First, at a very high level, STL is a logic language, so it's made up of logical operations like AND, OR, and NOT. And then the temporal part to the term signal temporal logic refers to the fact that these logical operations can be specified over time intervals. And so we can say things like, between this time and that time, we always want A and B to be true. Or we could also say things like, between this time interval, we eventually want B to be true. 
And then the signal part of the term signal temporal logic means that we are reasoning about these logical and temporal operations over continuous real value time series, such as the trajectory of a robot as it moves through space and time. And so what I have described here is a very high level description of the STL language. And so let's go into the details a little bit more. Within the language, there are logical and temporal operators. And the operators are shown here um, on the right. Um, and you can think of these operators as building blocks. Analogously, in the English language, we have words that act as building blocks for the language. Now, given these operators, um, there is an STL grammar that describes how we can combine these operations in order to create an STL formula. And again, this is say similar to the English grammar that describes how we can piece together words in order to make a sentence. And so now let's take a look at some examples on how to build an STL formula. In order to build a formula, we first start off with a predicate, which consists of a scalar valued function mu that takes in a state x and then checks if that value is less than c. And so on the left here, we have three different predicates, phi, psi, and theta. And each predicate is already an STL formula, but just a very simple one. And what we can do is we can use the grammar in order to create more complex formulas. Um, so first, let's look at the not or negation operation. The grammar tells us that we can take a formula phi and then apply the negation operation, and that will give us a new formula. And this is precisely what we have um, on the left here. We have phi prime is now equal to not phi. Um, similarly, looking at the AND operation, the grammar is telling us that we can combine two formulas, phi and psi, and through the AND operation, and that will spit out a new formula. And this is, again, what we have on the left here. We have psi prime is equal to, say, phi prime and psi. And then we have a similar thing for the UNTIL operation. Um, here we have theta prime is equal to theta until uh, psi prime. And we can continue this process. We can continue creating new STL formulas and combining them with other STL formulas using the grammar shown on the top right. Um, in fact, we can have, um, we can derive other commonly used temporal um, and logical operations like the or, implies, eventually, and always operations just by using that grammar. And so the idea here is that using these building blocks and the grammar, we can build arbitrarily complex STL formulas. But then the question then is, what do all these formulas mean? Right? We can combine them however we want, but what is the meaning behind each of these operations? And so the thing here is that STL is equipped with Boolean semantics meaning there is a systematic way to determine if, given a signal, an STL formula is true or false. And on this slide are the Boolean semantics of the STL operators and other commonly used operations like or implies eventually and always. I won't describe all of them here, but I'll just highlight a few in order to provide some intuition. In the first line, um, we have the predicate, and this is saying that a signal s starting at time t satisfies the predicate mu if and only if the state at time t if, um, or mu of the state at time t is less than c. Um, looking at the and operation, we say a signal starting at time t satisfies the formula phi and psi if and only if the signal at time t satisfies phi and the signal at time t satisfies psi. So that's pretty intuitive. Um, let, now let's take a look at a temporal operator. Um, so looking at the eventually operator, uh, we have a signal at time t satisfies eventually phi if and only if there exists a time between the interval a, b starting at time t such that 
the formula phi is true at least once. Um, and so to sum up, these Boolean semantics tell us whether or not a signal um, is true or false, given some formula. So th this is very nice, but what if we wanted something a little bit more informative, like to what extent does the signal satisfy the formula? Um, so for instance, if we were to perturb a signal a little bit, does the formula stay true or false, or does it switch? In other words, it would be really nice to have a measure of robustness. Um, and since STL is evaluated over signals, which are real value time series, we are actually able to um, construct this notion of robustness. So more concretely, an STL robustness value is a measure of how much a signal satisfies or violates an STL formula. And so here I'm going to give a very simple example. Suppose we have a formula phi that says that our robot needs to always stay below the speed limit. And then for this particular speed profile on the bottom left, um, the speed limit is never exceeded. So this will correspond to a positive robustness value. And the magnitude of this robustness value will correspond to how much below the speed limit the speed profile is. For this second speed profile, the speed limit is violated. So this would correspond to a negative robustness value. And again, the magnitude of this robustness value will correspond to how much it exceeds the speed limit. And then finally, in this last speed profile, the speed limit is violated even more. And so this would uh, correspond to a more negative robustness value. Um, and so this means that special to STL, it is equipped with quantitative semantics, which provides a systematic way to compute the robustness value for any STL formula. And so what I have shown here are the quantitative semantics. And again, I won't go through all of them, but I will highlight a few to provide some intuition. Um, so looking at the first line, we have the predicate. And the robustness value of a predicate is simply c minus mu of x evaluated at time t. Looking at the AND operation, the robustness value of, the, of a formula phi and psi is simply the minimum between the robustness value of phi and the robustness value of psi. Um, and then looking at the eventually operator, Remember, eventually means that between some time interval, we want the formula phi to be true at least once. And so the robustness formula will just correspond to taking the maximum robustness value between that time interval. OK, so with this notion of robustness, um, we can start to think about things like how changes in the input signal could affect the robustness value. In other words, we can start to think about gradients. And that's really exciting because gradients are ubiquitous, right? They are used in many robot decision-making and control algorithms. For example, many things, including neural networks, are constructed using gradient descent. The challenge now here is to find an efficient way to compute these robustness values and their gradients. And so this leads to the next part of the talk. Um, STLCG is a toolbox that does precisely that. It is an efficient way to compute STL robustness values and their gradients. And in this last part of the talk, I will give an overview of the technique behind STLCG. Um, I will provide some examples on how to use STLCG and some code demos um, showing the finer details of the toolbox. Um, so. One of the questions that we brought up earlier in this in this talk was how to embed domain expertise into the synthesis process. Well, what makes STLCG really exciting and useful is that it shares the same computational backbone as deep learning libraries. By representing STL robustness formulas as computation graphs, we can leverage modern automatic differentiation tools which are readily and freely available 
widely adopted, easy to use, and has many computational benefits such as GPU portability. And currently we have a package that uses PyTorch and we are currently working on a version in the Julia programming language. The idea behind STLCG is quite simple. For each STL robustness formula, we construct a corresponding computation graph. Now, many of these formulas are quite straightforward, um, except for the temporal operators. I won't go into too much detail here, but you can find more details in the paper cited at the bottom. Um, but the key idea here is that it involves designing a recurrent computation graph in order to perform dynamic programming. Anyway, the bottom line here is that for each STL operator, there is a corresponding computation graph that will um, compute the robustness value. And now the question is how to actually piece all these uh, computation graphs together because a formula is made up of multiple operators. And so what happens is that given an STL formula, we can look at the operators that are used to construct the formula and the ordering in which these operators were applied. And what this means is that we are looking at the syntactical structure in order to inform us how to um, stack each of these little computation graphs together. And remember, we are going through all this trouble because we want to leverage modern automatic differentiation tools that use computation graphs and these automatic differentiation tools are used widely in many deep learning libraries. Um, in terms of applications, STL has been used in a number of domains, such as motion planning, uh, control synthesis, imitation learning, parameter estimation, and sequence prediction. And there's a lot of ongoing work to expand this portfolio. At the same time, a lot of these applications use deep learning in some way, shape, or form. And so STLCG is a really exciting tool that bridges together temporal logics with deep learning. Now let's take a look at some examples demonstrating how we can combine STLCG with neural networks. A very simple way is to um, include an STL robustness term in the loss function when training neural networks. Um, and this is possible because we can actually now backpropagate through STL robustness formulas using STLCG. In this first example, we have a very simple supervised learning problem. The goal here is to learn, use a neural network to fit this noisy data. Um, and so just training a very simple feed forward neural network we're able to do a reasonably good job. And you can see that this neural network output shown in blue is able to capture this bump in this noisy data. Um, however, suppose based on domain expertise that we know between one to three seconds, the signal needs to be very close to 0 0.5. And we can construct an STL formula that describes this sort of behavior. And if that's the case, then the model we just learned isn't really doing a good job, as you can see on the top right. And so what we can do instead is to augment the training loss with an STL robustness term that will penalize the neural network output for violating the STL formula. And by simply doing this and holding everything else fixed, we can very easily produce a more desirable output, as you can see on the bottom right. In this next example, we have a sequence to sequence prediction problem. And what we have here is some trajectory history shown in green. And we want to be able to predict what the future trajectory looks like shown in blue. And this is a pretty typical setup for human behavior prediction problems. Now, if we trained a recurrent neural network, which is a special type of neural network tailored towards sequential data, then we can very easily perform this prediction problem. Uh, we can, yeah, sorry, we can very easily perform this prediction. However, there really isn't any way of knowing how this model will behave past the two second mark um, in a region where we don't have any data. Now, 
suppose that based on domain expertise that we know that the sequence will converge to 0 0.5 um, at some point in the future, and we can construct an STL formula describing this behavior. Um, so this kind of uh, setup is reminiscent, say, of a car performing a lane change. We know that a car will eventually end up in the adjacent lane, but not somewhere halfway. And similar to the previous example, we can just add an STL term to the loss function and penalize the model if it produces a negative robustness value. And simply by doing this, and again, holding everything else fixed, we can see that we are able to predict the blue trajectories and also ensure that the future trajectory converges to about 0 0.5. Now for the final part of the talk, um, we're gonna uh, present some code demos. Um, so first, the STLCG package requires a Python 3 installation um, and PyTorch, which you can very easily um, install use, um, go, by going to the website. Uh, and in order to visualize the graphs, you will also need the PyTorchViz package, which you can um, uh, uh, install using this link. Um, and given these requirements, then you can then clone the STLCG package through this link. And then in the next few slides, I'm going to show you how to construct a formula, um, how to compute the robustness, and how to take gradients through the robustness value. Um, in this code snippet on the top, we are just importing the relevant packages. On the bottom, we are constructing the signals that we are going to use for the STL formula. And so the first three lines are just defining a signal using NumPy. Um, what this signal looks like is not very important, as this is just a toy example. But what is important is that we need to turn these signals into PyTorch tensors, um, shown here in the X and W. Um, and for this example, these signals will be fixed, um, so we don't need to be taking gradients with respect to these signals. And that is why we have set the requires grad argument to be false. An important thing to note here is that these tensors or these signals have the size and um, batch size by time dimension by state dimension. And then the bottom two lines where we're defining C and D, these are going to be the parameter C for our predicate. In the examples that we're going to see next, we are going to take gradients with respect to these parameters. And therefore, we have set the requires grad argument to be true. And here is a picture of the signals of X and W. Um, and again, what these signals look like isn't very important, but just note that these are time series um, with fixed time steps. Um, okay, so in this code demo or code snippet, we are gonna be constructing an STL formula. So in the first two lines, we are defining an expression, which you can think of as named tensors. Um, the reason we have this is to make constructing the formula a little neater and is for visualization purposes. So in these expressions, the first argument is going to be the name of that signal. And then the second argument is going to be the, the signal values itself. Um, an important thing to note here is that these signals need to be time reversed because of the way the computation graphs are set up and the fact that we are performing dynamic programming we are going to be sweeping through these sig signals backwards in time. And so that's why we have flipped the signals in the first dimension, um, because the first dimension corresponds to the time dimension. Um, and then in these next couple of lines, we are defining the, um, the STL formula. So phi1 and psi1, as you can see, are predicates, where we have a signal x is less than c, and then we have a signal w is less than d. Um, here, we've overloaded the less than operator to make this um, kind of visually neater. Um, however, you could also just use what is commented out instead. And then he, um, in the next two lines, we have phi and psi, where we're applying the always and eventually operator. Um, and then you can see that here we have defined a time interval. Um, an important thing here to note is that these time intervals are referring to indices and not the actual time units. 
And so an interval of, say, 0 to 2 um, actually corresponds to a time interval of 0 to 2 times delta t, where delta t is your time steps for your particular application. Um, and then finally, we, ha uh, we have one more step where we have to find theta um, to equal phi and psi. Um, and again, we've overloaded the AND operator to make this a little neater to type out. Um, and then here, so we have to find an STL formula theta, um, phi and psi, and also theta one, sorry, not theta, phi one and psi one. And then we can also print out what these um, formulas look like. So you can see here we've printed out theta, and then the next line will visualize what the graph looks like. Um, and so this is what you will see. You can see that here is the string representing the formula, and then the picture here is showing the syntactical structure of the STL formula. In this code snippet, um, we're going to evaluate what the robustness value is going to be given the input signals. And so you can see here the inputs to the formula will have two signals, x and w, because there are two predicates, as you can see on the right here. Um, here we're using the expressions that we defined earlier, but you could also just use tenses. Um, but remember, you need to flip them um, or reverse the time dimension. And then we have two parameters here, p scale and scale. So p scale um, is just a multiplicative constant for the predicate robustness formula. The default is one, um, and depending on your application, you might want to choose a different number, but that is completely up to you. And then for the scale parameter, this is the smoothness parameter for the max and min approximation. Um, in this approximation, the larger the scale value is, the closer we are to the true max and min value. Um, but if you set it to minus one, we're just going to use the exact max and min function instead. And so that is what the default value is. Um, and then we can just compute the robustness by typing the formula that we're interested in. And in this case, it's theta. Um, so we have theta dot robustness with, in, with the inputs and then the uh, arguments, as you can see. Um, and this will spit out the robustness value. On the next slide, I have shown, I am showing the robustness value for each time step along the signal. And these traces um, correspond to the different subformulas. Um, so you can see this is for phi1 and psi1. And then this plot is for phi, and this plot is for psi. And then this plot is um, showing you the traces for phi and psi. And then on the bottom right here, we're taking the AND operation. So it's going to take the minimum between those two traces. Um, I won't go th through all, the, all these plots, but I encourage you to pause this video to take a closer look at this um, and try and understand how these traces correspond to those quantitative semantics that I showed you a few slides earlier. In this code demo, we're going to show how we can take gradients with respect to those predicate parameters C and D. If you have used PyTorch before, this will look very familiar as we're using a lot of the same functionalities when taking um, gradients with respect to neural network parameters. Um, and so here on the first couple of lines, we are defining an optimizer. Here, we're just using a built-in PyTorch Atom optimizer, but you could use whatever optimizer you want, depending on your application. Um, but we are telling this optimizer that the variables that we would like to take gradients with respect to um, are C and D. Um, so recall at the very beginning, when we were defining C and D, we set the requires grad argument to be true. Um, and this is necessary if we want to take gradients with respect to those, uh, uh, with respect to C and D. And then after you do this, uh, we then define a loss function. Again, depending on your application, you can define the loss however you want. Um, just in this example, we have defined the loss to be uh, robustness squared. 
And then we've just set the scale parameter to be 10, just to smooth out those max and min functions that are used when computing robustness. Um, and then in the last two steps, um, these are the lines of code needed to backpropagate through the graph and then take a gradient step. And then on the bottom here are the values of C and D before and after taking a gradient step. And you can see that they are different. Um, and then in this um, example, rather than taking gradients through the per predicate parameters, we are now looking at the case when the predicate function is a neural network and we want to take gradients with respect to those neural network parameters. Um, and so here at the top of this code snippet, it's just a bit of code that is defining a very small neural network. In particular, it's a three-layer neural network with ReLU activations. Um, and again, if you have used PyTorch before to train neural networks, this should look very familiar. Um, so here we're using a torch.nn.module in order to create this neural network. And then we're going to call this mu function. Um, so, so this mu predicate function is going to be a neural network, and we have called it mu underscore network here. Um, and then similar to the code in the previous slide, we need to define an optimizer. Um, in this case, we're just using the built-in atom optimizer in PyTorch, and we're specifying that the variables that it needs to take gradients with respect to are going to be the mu network parameters. Um, and then this code down here, um, in the middle here, is again very similar to what you saw in the previous slide where we're just defining an STL formula. And then um, this bottom code snippet looks exactly the same as the previous slide, except now the signal, rather than it being fixed ahead of time, is going to be the outputs of the neural network evaluated at um, multiple time steps. And so the signal y is actually going to be mu of x at time one, mu of x at time two, un until some finite horizon. Um, and then again, we evaluate a loss. And then we uh, backpropagate through the graph and then take a gradient step. Um, and so in this plot here, um, this is just showing how the neural network outputs are changing um, after each gradient step. Again, the, what these lines look like doesn't really matter as this is just a toy example. But the thing to note is that the outputs of the neural network are changing because the parameters of the neural network are changing as we take gradient steps. Um, so hopefully by now you have a better idea of what STL is and in particular what STL-CG um, can do um, and how STL-CG could be used in a range of robotics applications. A particularly interesting area is looking at how we can design novel neural network architectures that are embedded with temporal logics. Um, because as I mentioned before, STLCG uses the same computational backbone as deep neural networks. And we hope that we are able, we, we hope that by leveraging temporal logics, we can better encode domain expertise into the model, um, such as driving rules for autonomous driving, um, we also hope that we could use it to improve long-term prediction performance um, and create these rule-abiding agents, which could be very useful for developing smarter AI agents in simulation environments. We also hope that by incorporating logic into a model, it can aid in performing complex decision-making and control tasks. And additionally, there is the potential to create more interpretable structure and transparency in neural networks through the lens of temporal logic. I hope that from this talk, you have gained a better understanding of what signal temporal logic is and how STLCG is an easy to use toolbox that utilizes modern deep learning software in order to compute robustness values and, and its gradients. Um, you can check out the code on our GitHub 
uh, feel free to email me with any questions you may have. Thank you so much for your time.